These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, and Bird Polar Research Center to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lake residents. I am Jill Dentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are two speakers who will discuss how a changing climate could impact water quality from a regional perspective and how our attitudes and behaviors towards water quality could affect that change. Starting our webinar today will be Dr. Anthony Kendall, visiting graduate associate within Geological Sciences at Michigan State University, followed by Dr. Robin Wilson, assistant professor within the School of the Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State University. A few logistical aspects before we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at 12.45, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during any of our presentations, please use the chat feature located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and Melinda Huntley of Ohio Sea Grant Extension will collect and pose your questions out to our speakers at the end of our last presentation. We have more than 250 participants on this, on this uh, webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies from around the country, elected officials, as well as academia, agency, and nonprofit groups from around the Great Lakes. Feel free to keep these questions coming throughout the presentations, and we should have a great question and answer session. As a reminder, this, is being, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat. Please take a few minutes after the presentations to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce Anthony Kendall from Michigan State University, who will present Climate Change, Biofuels, and Land Use Legacy. Okay, Anthony, I'm going to send the, I'm going to pass over the ball to you. Thanks, Jill. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today, and um, a great group in attendance. And what I'd like to talk about is I'd like to, as, as Jill mentioned, localize some of the types of changes that we've all seen and heard about um, in terms of climate to water resources in the Great Lakes region. And in particular, I'm going to be, be talking about climate change along with issues like biofuels and one that I'll discuss in a minute called land use legacy that are more related to the land use change that we are currently experiencing and may continue to see over the next, uh, the coming century. And the subtitle on my talk here is Trusting Computer Models to Guide Water Resource Management Decision or tra Trajectories. And I, I, I want to focus on not just the, the specific predictions, but the types of models and how we, how we uh, can gain some confidence in using those model predictions over, over what are essentially very long-term forecasts. Um, before I get started, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, David Heinemann uh, at MSU, a longtime collaborator who I also uh, received my PhD from, Brian Pijanowski at, at Purdue University, and then Deepak Ray, formerly of Purdue University, now at, at University of Minnesota. So the central question that I'm going to address uh, this afternoon is how will Great Lakes water resources change during this century? And I think that's uh, a lot, the reason why a lot of us are here. And this is in response to climate change. So the graphic on the right shows a forecast for the summer of 2100, a specific a A1B emission scenario from the IPCC AR4. Land use change, this is an image from Brian Pijanowski showing the ur urbanization forecast for Michigan out to 2040 uh, using recent urbanization rates over the last 20 years. Land use intensification is another important factor that, uh, along with increasing population and, and global and national affluence, will lead to changes in how land, use, land, co land covers and uses are managed and the intensity of that management. And then agricultural demand shifts, both in response to rising affluence which drives up the, the, de the demand for meat products from livestock, as well as things like biofuels, which may lead to, to dramatic shifts in the types of, of plants or agricultural crops that are, are planted. And this image here shows miscanthus being grown at the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, uh, one, a facility that Michigan State University is a, a collaborator in. 
So really we need models to answer this question of, of how water resources are going to change over the next century. And we use a variety of models uh, to simulate temperature and precipitation changes. We use regional and global climate models. And I think a lot of us are, are familiar with some of the products of those, and I'll show you more um, in, in detail in just a moment. But really, more than wanting to know how warm it's going to be, whether what coat to bring and whether we need an umbrella, we're really interested in how temperature and precip affect soil moisture, stream flow, lake levels, things that actually influence how we use our water resources. And to get at those, we need to use hydrologic and crop models that respond to predicted forecasts from those climate models. And then also, to get at land use changes, we need models as well. And types of models vary, vary quite widely here, but broadly they're land transformation models that are, that are driven either about assumptions related to land use transformation or economic models that, that respond to a variety of factors. And, and I'll, I'll show you examples from one of those today. So getting first into climate, major changes are likely in store for the Great Lakes region, but what can we expect? And really, the answer depends on what scenarios we assume. So here on the left is a graphic showing um, some data I've extracted from a series of 24 different global climate models that were brought together as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's AR4 uh, process. And this graphic shows per, uh, the ensemble or model multi-model average temperature change over the 21st century under three different emission scenarios. And those, as labeled by the IPCC, are A1b, which is sort of a, a moderate emissions growth compared to other scenarios they considered, the uh, A2 scenario, which is a higher emissions growth pathway, and then the B1 scenario, which is a lower emissions growth. So each of those emission scenarios then has quite an impact on forecast temperature, although the, the impacts on forecast precipitation for the Great Lakes region are really less clear because of greater annual variability in pre precipitation, as well as um, the models don't separate in terms of their emissions, uh, the emission scenarios don't separate until about 2070. So there's not a lot of guidance in terms of how precip will respond to the, the different emission scenarios from these, this set. And so really to, to address this from a management perspective, we need to consider the widest range of feasible scenarios that we can. And, and this helps us to constrain what's the, what's the envelope of, of possible responses that we might see in our system. But then beyond simply saying, well, how do we take the model outputs, we, we then have the very relevant question of what model do we choose? So, and one solution is to take many models and average them all together. And this graphic, I think, illustrates that by taking that green line from the temperature plot on the previous page, and that's shown here in black, and then around it I've plot I've, I've shaded a spread of model predictions given by plus or minus one standard deviation of annual model predictions. Basically what this is saying is this is roughly the spread of year-to-year -year temperatures forecast by this set of models. And clearly there's a, there's a wide a four and a half to five degree range of temperatures in at any given year. But that multi-model ensemble average really averages out those to, to um, arrive at a, a prediction that has a much more consistent trend. And so this is very often done in, in assessing the risks due to climate change to use these multi-model ensemble averages. So then using those multi-model ensembles for the A1B scenario, that mid-range emissions growth scenario, I'll show you a couple of maps that I've extracted that show temperature and precip changes forecast for the Great Lakes Basin, just so that everyone's kind of familiar with the magnitude that we're talking about. This plot, or this map shows annual temperature forecasts and they're, they're forecast to rise significantly over the next 100 years or so, or actually now about 85 years. The lowest forecast increase are in the southeast portion around 3 degrees, with the highest in the, in the north and northwest at about 4 degrees. And the models generally agree quite well in these, so there's a lot of confidence in the forecast temperature prediction. There's a little bit less confidence in the forecast precipitation increases, although Broadly, the, the ensemble averages show increases in precip on an annual basis out at 2095. The, in the north, the, the increase is around 10%, while in the south, they're around 5 to 8%. The picture is a little bit more complicated if you look, though, at summer rainfall only. So on, on average, on an annual basis, the models suggest that precip will increase across the region, but 
particularly during the summer, there's very wide model disagreement on not just the trend or the, the magnitude of change, but the trend of the change. Some models show significant increases in summer pre precip, others show significant decreases, and on the average, the ensemble shows no significant trends, except for perhaps in the, norther, the more northern westerly part of the model, or of the, uh, the, the, the Great Lakes Basin. So this, this picture where you have an increase in, in annual precip is going to drive very significant changes to the hydrologic cycle. But this critical summer period where rain-fed agriculture depends on, on precipitation and stream flows and, and, and fish spawning and all sorts of uh, both ecosystem and anthrop anthropogenic uses rely on that summer precipitation, the models have a, a cloudier outlook in that regard at this point. So now here, here's the more important question from my perspective of how will these forecast temperature and precip changes actually impact our regional water resources? And to get at that, we need models, and as I've stated. And the hydrologic models have to be robust to changes in both climate and, and land use. So very commonly, water use uh, managers will, will make decisions with the assistance of a variety of types of models, which are often statistical. These statistical models are derived implicitly using current climate and land use conditions that those, the assumptions that went into deriving those models become less and less valid as climate and land use change, change more significantly. So a new class of models has, has a, a arisen in the last five to 10 years to try and address this, the shortcoming of a, a large variety of existing models for doing forecasts. And these models address those limitations by directly simulating physical processes in both surface and groundwater and linking them together. And those models then are driven by changes in climate and land use as parameters to the model without changing the inherent structure of the model. And that's very important in terms of getting confidence out of those long-term model predictions. One particular model that I'll talk about here today, uh, the Integrated Landscape Hydrology Model, or ILHM, is one that we have developed, uh, David Heinemann and I, over the last several years here at Michigan State. ILHM simulates essentially the complete terrestrial hydrologic water cycle. Uh, surface water flows, groundwater flows, and, and vegetative water uses, as well as human water uses. And it does so by separating the, a catchment into, or any particular area, into four separate domains. You have a surface routing, which handles stream flows, um, lakes, and wetland levels, and then a canopy and root zone layer. Beneath that is a deep unsaturated zone where water moves downward until eventually reaching the water table and the saturated aquifer. And in each of these domains, water fluxes are simulated hourly, for each cell, uh, both horizontally, horizontally and vertically. So, so parameters within the model vary explicitly over the entire domain, which is, um, which is shown here as these different cell divisions of, of each domain. And some of the, this graphic is very complicated, and what I'm showing it only to illustrate the, the types of fluxes that ILHM simulates, including evaporative and, and transpiration fluxes, along with overland flow runoff, as well as deep percolation beneath the root zone and eventual recharge of the saturated aquifer. So there's a large variety of fluxes that are simulated both in uplands and in wetland areas. So we'd like to use then a model such as ILHM to simulate the impacts of climate and land use change on hydrology. So here's one particular example that we've been working on recently that um, we've, for the Muskegon River watershed in central lower Michigan, and I'll show you where that is on the next slide, We've extracted out of those 24 different global climate models that I mentioned earlier, we've extracted monthly changes in temperature and precip over the next 95 years, uh, or out to 2095, I should say. And we've done that for each of the three emission scenarios that I mentioned earlier. And the graphic on the right plots seasonally the changes in temperature and in precipitation, so winter, fall, spring, and summer. And you can see in general the summer trends are all relatively uniform whereas the winter trends, uh, or ex excuse me, the, the trends in pre temperature are relatively uniform, whereas the trends in precipitation vary significantly by season, um, with summer, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, not increasing along with uh, forecast precip in, in the other seasons. So along with those climate change forecasts for both the 2050 and 2095 period, we're going to simulate land use change as well. And we've created explicitly uh, 
using uh, the land transformation model developed by Brian Pijanowski, we've created three different scenarios. One takes current land use and allows urbanization to proceed out to 2050 and then 2095. So shown here is urbanization forecast out to 2050. Um, so this is a change, a, a, a forecast land use map. In the second scenario, we've allowed urbanization to continue, but then also allowed reforestation to encroach into grass and agricultural areas. Um, and that reforestation has been the dominant land use change process other than urbanization over the last half century or so within the Muskegon River watershed. And finally, we've, we've asked the question, well, what, what would happen if global demand drives significant shifts in agricultural prices that leads to increased or the expansion of agricultural areas into marginal agricultural lands. And to, to create that scenario, we've taken virtually every inch of the watershed that isn't either urban, forecast urban, or a protected area such as a state or national forest and converted it over to agricultural use. So this is sort of an extreme scenario to just look at the edge of what, of what um, agricultural influence might be. And again, we've created these each for 2050, which I've shown, and for 2095. And there's a, a very large variety of model outputs. And the one that I'm going to focus on here is a, looking at changes to groundwater recharge. And I think for very good reason that I'll describe in a moment, groundwater recharge really controls a lot of how the watershed is going to respond to climate change, and especially here in the Great Lakes Basin. The plot on the right shows a whole bunch of different curves that correspond to this matrix of land use change and climate change scenarios that we're considering. And it averages across uh, 10 years of, of simulated climate and land use change, the monthly average recharge change relative to our baseline conditions. So positive values indicate an increase in groundwater recharge in those months, negative values a decrease. So the big trends here, the big changes are uh, greatly increased recharge during, during the, the winter months to early spring, and then a significant decline in late spring recharge, along with a smaller decline in late growing season recharge. And these declines are very sig significant relative to the total amount of recharge in this area. These are increases on the order of 10 to 15 percent on, on an annual basis. So focusing then on the mechanisms that are driving these, the primary one is more frequent snowmelt. So the Muskegon River watershed typically has a persistent snowpack which sticks around until late March or early April. But according to these scenarios, that happens less and less frequently as time goes on. So you get more fall and winter recharge as this, this temporary snowpack melts, which are conditions which would be much more common, say, in current Indiana or even southern Indiana or Ohio. And that brings with it then while it increases fall and winter recharge, you get less spring recharge. So that has some important impacts on, on uh, surface water hydrology. Also, the longer growing season leads to drier summer soils and a reduction in late summer and early fall recharge. So if we look at some of the implications of these, the changes to groundwater recharge and overall, uh, the overall hydrologic response of the Muskegon River watershed, we see more winter, winter recharge leading to higher spring water tables, which then leads to higher peak flows in streams, more flooded areas in, in, uh, in wetlands, and so forth. So you get more flooding under this scenario. And then less spring recharge allows the water table to decline earlier in the summer, which then leads to lower, stream, lower flows in streams and lower lake levels in the summer. And then a longer low flow period in those streams will just further exacerbate that con condition. So what we're seeing is really the streams behaving much more uh, much more fl or in a flashier manner, so, so very much unlike what we've seen in the Great Lakes Basin in, in the past. Overall, the, the groundwater resource has increased, but because of the, the differential impacts that this will have by season, you'll get much more in, in the fall and winter and less in the summer, this may not effectively increase the resource available for anthropogenic uses. And these results, by the way, do agree broadly with, with results from regional summaries, both national and international efforts. The real advantage here is that we're not just saying these are the broad changes from a qualitative standpoint, but actually predicting how a particular climate change scenario and a particular land use change scenario will affect stream, stream flows, groundwater recharge on a local basis. So important water quality impacts include sediment transport increases, more sewer overflows, 
and then warmer water temperatures in, in streams and lakes. And um, although that may be mitigated to some extent by a very slow groundwater response to temperature increases at the surface. And then finally, large changes to groundwater transport of nutrients and contaminants. And that's some, an, an aspect I'd like to focus on because it's particularly relevant in the Great Lakes Basin. If we look at pathways that water can take from precipitation to streams, most commonly, if we're thinking about water quality, we're, we're envisioning runoff. And it's a process that can take hours to days and bring sediment and other nutrients and, and contaminants into the stream system. But really more relevant in many areas is groundwater discharge which into streams, which can, from the point at which recharge occurs at the water table to eventual discharge, that travel time can be very slow, on the order of years, decades, or even centuries. Groundwater is a major provider of annual stream flows within the Great Lakes Basin. This is a map of base flow index, which you can interpret to mean approximately the, the, the proportion of stream flow which comes from groundwater. So 50 would mean 50% of the stream flow comes from groundwater, 50% from surface water, direct surface water runoff. So I've highlighted or outlined all of the areas that are above 50% uh, base flow index to indicate areas where, where base flow or groundwater are of, the major contributor to stream flows uh, during, the, during the season. So in, in addition to that, travel times in groundwater, as I mentioned, can be very long. On the right, I've shown a model output from the Muskegon River watershed of groundwater travel times in years, where the lighter colors are shorter times and the, the deeper colors are longer travel times. So you can see the travel times get to be decades or even centuries in some locations. And this is, this is what drives then a very long response time between changes at the surface and changes in groundwater transport of, of nutrients and contaminants that can take, as I mentioned, decades or even centuries. And th this, this is most important in areas that have thick saturated aquifers and deep water tables, which pretty much overlaps areas that have high base flow index. So this applies over much of the Great Lakes Basin. And so to what extent is land use or to what land use is current water quality responding? So obviously there will be some impact of what's on the surface right now, but because of the long groundwater response, there's going to be a long land use legacy as well. And how different is this from today's land use? So what we'd like is we'd like a map of land use legacy that combines somehow groundwater travel times with historical land use change information. And really in practice, we need to do this with a model because the types of information that we need land use change and groundwater travel times aren't really available from other sources in, in most or all cases. So as, as I showed you before, here's the groundwater travel time model. We did this with USGS code ModFlow, but it can really be simulated with a whole variety of existing models. What is much less common is a backcast land use change model that allows us to essentially take observations of land use. So here are observations of land use at 1978 and 1998. And this model created by Deepak Ray and Brian Pijanowski allows us to both go forward in time with that land use as well as backward in time to see how land use has changed over historical, the period of historical record. And the date here should read 1830, um, just as a note. So th this simulation is driven by actual measurements or observations of, of um, agricultural extent, uh, forested areas, and, and urban areas over this, this time period, but the actual spatial distribution and how that's placed within each county or, or each area that you have that information for is, is dictated by the model. And, and it's the model learns by changes that it observes between uh, two observed land use times, like 78 and 98. So we combine the backcast land use change model with the groundwater age to produce a land use legacy map. And this one for the Muskegon River watershed shows there are very significant differences between the land use legacy map, or essentially the, the groundwater signal, the current groundwater signal in the Muskegon River, where it has 20% more forest, 10% less agriculture, and 75% less urban within the land use legacy map than the current map. And so, so there are very significant differences overall, but these differences can vary greatly by planning unit. So looking at the township level, you can see that township A has very little difference, which differences are highlighted, differences between the legacy map and current land use are highlighted in red. Township A has very little difference between the current and, and the legacy land use, whereas township B is largely different. So the legacy map is very different from current. So this suggests varying utility between these different counties or between these different townships 
in looking towards something like a land use legacy map to help drive decision making with regards to water resources. So what I've been discussing here are a series of multi-decadal forces and equally long system response times. So climate change, I mean, th these are changes that occur over many decades that essentially inexorably alter water quantity and quality. To the degree that state or local managers have any control over greenhouse gases, this is essentially an externality that's being forced on the system. So we really need to understand this climate change in order to understand how much leverage managing managers actually have in, in, in altering the stream water quality. And then land use change can be equally inexorable. Global changes in population, economic demand, and agricultural production will place a whole new series of stresses on water resources, both from direct urban use as well as, as irrigated agricultural use and industrial uses as well. And then the land use legacy concept that I've highlighted, uh, especially for the Great Lakes Basin, indicate that current water quality might still be responding to land uses from decades ago. And similarly, any decisions we make today might take decades to be fully realized. So we really have to stretch our timeline in terms of making management decisions to include long-term thinking and long-term modeling. And as I had mentioned earlier, managers have long relied on a variety of models, and, but those are largely either steady state models or their short-term models of the system. And they've applied these with very sophisticated decision support systems and a variety of other tools into their decision-making process. But to that, I'm suggesting that we need to bring, because of these long-term drivers and the long-term responses, we need to bring a series of new tools and different approaches that, that incorporate those long-term effects. And we need to be very careful with how uncertainties expand over time and how uncertainties multiply between but, by taking a model prediction from climate, passing it through a land use change model to a, a hydrologic model, you get a whole series of uncertainties that have to be addressed. And tools to do that include multi-model ensembles or multiple scenarios or a variety of other things um, to help constrain both the envelope of, of model certainty as well as the range of possible forecasts. And because these are largely these are academic tools that, that I've talked about here today, Really, what we need to focus on promoting cooperation between universities, researchers, nat national labs, and state and local water managers to bring some of those expertise, types of expertise, to the more local or regional level. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming out today. And any questions that you have, make sure to get them to, the, to Jill or the hosts. Or f also feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is kendall30 uh, with one L at msu.edu. And of course, I would like to acknowledge our, our funders, the NSF, Michigan State University, and Great Lakes Fisheries Trust, without which we, we couldn't have done any of this work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. Now that we've seen from Dr. Kendall's presentation that a change in climate could have impacts on water quality in the Great Lakes region, now we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Robin Wilson. Often we think only of environmental changes when, that may occur with a changing climate, but how we react to these changes could create change itself. Dr. Wilson joins us to discuss what motivates citizen decisions as they relate to water quality and how we might communicate with such audiences to improve individual decisions given these expected climate-related impacts on water quality. Dr. Wilson, I will hand you the ball. Okay, great. Thanks, Jill. Let me know if you have any problems hearing me. Um, so like Jill said, I'm just a little more background on me. I'm a behavioral decision scientist, and so I'm really interested in the sorts of things that, um, I guess, the ways that people process information, um, the sorts of processes that people use to make decisions, what motivates people to make decisions. In particular, how do people make decisions under risk and uncertainty, meaning um, what impact maybe do their perceptions of risk have on um, their motivation to act in a certain way or to fail to act in a certain way. And so what I'm going to be presenting today is just um, some initial data from really two studies that are kind of building towards a larger study that I think ties in a lot with what Anthony was already talking about today. Um, but this idea of trying to better understand how beliefs about water quality and, and risks related to wa water quality might influence citizen decisions, specifically we could be looking at um, decisions to vote in a certain way, so kind of policy attitudes to su support regulatory change from the top down. But more importantly, and what I focus on more, because I think it's often the piece that we overlook a bit when we're thinking about these models and predictions for the future, 
is what I would say is the bottom-up kind of behavioral change. So this idea that there are things that people can do voluntarily, changes that we can make as homeowners and landowners and people um, living in a particular watershed, if we understand the impact that we're having on water quality, both upstream and downstream, that we can make changes um, to, to de decrease that impact. And so when Anthony's talking about um, impacts on water resources and land use change and intensification and ag demand, what can we what can we learn about human behavior to potentially change some of those impacts to um, maybe better inform our models about land use change, about intensification, about ag demand? And if we do that, can we actually predict how changes in human behavior could even offset some of these predicted climate impacts? So I look at um, <coughs> impacts on water resources as coming from the human side and from the natural side, and maybe we can't you know, easily fix these sorts of predicted climate impacts, but maybe we can change some of what we know about the human side and changes in land use and land management, which clearly, as Anthony pointed out, are big influences on, on water quality and water resources. So that's the big picture of where I'm going. Um, slides to click through. So the problem is just this idea that human land use and land management contributes to water quality issues. For the Great Lakes, uh, for, for fresh water, there are specific issues of concern. Anthony touched on a lot of the sedimentation runoff. Um, for freshwater, phosphorus is a big concern, and a lot of that does come from agriculture and, and sections of the Midwest, um, but also from other sources as well, clearly. And so the two studies that I want to highlight, um, just to give you some initial idea about the sorts of things that people are thinking about and what's influencing their behaviors relevant to, to water quality, we have one study where we looked at rural to urban homeowners, landowners, um, this was largely in central Ohio, so people kind of living from the rural fringe up to the, to the urban edge. And, and the sorts of decisions that they're making, the sorts of actions that they could take have to do with things that you might do around your home for the most part. Um, you know, chemical lawn applications, this, this desire to have the perfectly green and weed-free lawn, which is a pretty intense social norm in a lot of suburban areas, um, which can lead to runoff and impacts on water quality in that way. Um, dumping, so you can have people um, partially because they're unaware of the impacts of that, um, clearly dumping straight into stormwater drains, into streams, which then is, is carried downstream. And, and if you're in the Great Lakes watershed or you're draining in that direction, then clearly you're having an impact on that directly. Um, Streamside maintenance, so a lot of these people, um, because of the pretty um, um, intense network of headwater streams and whatnot that we have in the Midwest, you actually have a lot of people living on these smaller headwaters, and they could be mowing up to the edge. They could be altering the riparian in an area, riparian area in a way that might have a negative influence on water quality. Um, so those are some of the things that are the actions or decisions that we might focus on at the kind of individual homeowner or landowner scale. Um, and then we have another study that's a little earlier um, in development at this point, but I'll highlight a few things from that. And this is focused on agricultural landowners. And so clearly they can have a pretty big impact because they're, they own large amounts of land, they manage large amounts of land much more actively than an individual home or, home or landowner would be in a, in a more rural to urban setting. And so they're, they're making decisions, and this is where this land use piece I think comes in a lot, um, but also land management. So not only how do we think the, the land use will change over time, but how could we, we change the management of that land. So as Anthony was pointing out, if, if agricultural land use increased, and we had a decrease in urbanization, um, could we offset that impact by changing our management of, of that land? So thinking about both these pieces is important for agriculture. So you have land use decisions, um, which clearly can be the cropping choice. So you could have economic forces encouraging you to um, plant corn more often to maybe change your rotation. So there's rotation decisions that go into land use. And then also there's land management. So regardless of, of how much agricultural land you have, you're managing it through nutrient applications through tillage practices, um, both of which can contribute to runoff and sedimentation, and again, some of these, these influences on water resources. So clearly it's important to think about human decisions um, because the sorts of things that we're doing across the human landscape is changing water quality, and then that in turn is creating risks back to society. So we talk a lot about ecosystem services and the idea that healthy streams, healthy natural systems, provide services to people by um, giving us clean water, by providing recreational opportunities, by enhancing economic growth. You know, so there are, there are these um, direct services, these direct benefits that people could, could receive from a healthy system, but in fact, we're often making decisions to, to kind of decrease those services and to, to promote kind of risks to humans. So 
for human health, things that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, but everything from neurotoxins to just skin irritants, pathogens in the water, environmental health that we've you know, been dealing with some of these algae issues and in the Midwest, um, just impacts on biodiversity in general, upstream and downstream, um, a decrease in these ecosystem services. And of course, things that people might even think about more, recreational opportunities, risk to those, so we can't fish, we can't swim, we can't boat if we don't ca take care of these resources. And then economic sorts of things, some, some of which might be fairly direct and so impacts on fisheries and the impact that that could have in the Great Lakes is pretty large but also tourism in those areas, and then property values, which is a little more indirect, but if we see decreases in, in the quality of the lake and lake conditions, then clearly that could have an impact on property values for people living in those areas. So these are the sorts of risks that we're interested in, and we're interested in seeing to what extent people think about these and which of these are most important to them, and can we communicate um, impacts on water quality relevant to these risks that people care about the most. So when we think about informing decision making, there's really these two pieces that we usually think about from a behavioral science perspective. There's one, the need to improve knowledge about the issue. So we recognize that people need to have a good understanding of these issues, but a lot of research over the past probably 20 to 30 years has also made it quite clear to us that knowledge is not the key to behavior change. So we want to enhance knowledge and inform people, but we can't assume that if someone knows more about the problem, that they'll make better choices. There's a big disconnect between those things. And so part of what I think can connect that is this, this idea of framing the problem in light of relevant risk. So I can know a lot about the issue, but I may not act if I don't care, right? So what is this connection between knowledge and action? It's concern. It's a perception that impacts are personal and local. These are the sorts of things that we have um, evidence to show that they actually do have a pretty, good, pretty big influence on behavior and someone's willingness to adopt uh, maybe more positive action. Um, related to water quality or, or issues of that nature. So when we're thinking about improving knowledge, we want to know what do people know about stream health and water quality, what do they not know? What do people know about human impacts? So are they making those connections between human activities and then the resulting um, impacts to the natural, the natural system, in this case, so, so um, streams and lakes and water quality? Um, when we think about framing the problem in light of relevant risks, we're asking questions like, what motivates people's stream stewardship decisions? What is it that they care about? Why are it, for those people that are acting in a positive way, why is that? Um, what do people care about in regards to poor water quality? What are the issues that they're focusing on? And so what we've done is we've done, I, again, I've mentioned this briefly, but some initial work that's leading to some, to some things we're starting to, to develop at this point. Um, but the two studies I want to highlight, again, one focused on these kind of rural to urban citizens, one focus more on farmers and agricultural decisions. Both of them use what is known as a mental models methodology, and, and it's not super important what that's about other than it's a methodology that comes from the field of risk communication. And it's built on this assumption that um, if we want to inform people and kind of educate people about an issue, we need to take some time to figure out what those gaps in knowledge might be, what are the things they know and don't know. We don't want to waste our time communicating about the things that are understood well. Um, but we um, want to address those gaps and those misperceptions that are most important. And then through that, again, we also want to understand what are people's perceptions of risk? What are the things that are most important to them? And can we frame information um, in light of those kind of salient issues? And so what Mental Models does is it builds an, an expert model, kind of an expert conception of the risk and what's important, what sorts of factors influence the presence of that risk, the likelihood of it occurring, the consequences of it if it happens. And then we, we use that as kind of a baseline to develop then what we call a mental model of the target audience, which is just their kind of conception of the issue, what they think the risk is about, what they think is important, what they think influences it. And then by comparing those two, you can get a pretty good idea of where there are similarities and differences. And what this does is it starts to facilitate what we call a two-way process of communication. So not only helping experts better communicate with perhaps a lay audience or a target audience of some sort um, about the things that that audience really wants to know and needs to know, but also allowing that target audience to say, hey, here's the things we're thinking about. Maybe you haven't thought about this. And, and I've done studies in the past where that target group has highlighted areas that then scientists and other experts have said, well, hey, that's an area that we need to put more effort into. We need to research that to better understand it. So it definitely has a kind of mutual respect, and, and it, it gets away from this idea of just educating people and telling them what we think they need to know. 
So again, the first study is focused a lot on what citizens knew about water quality, um, what the major influences were on their stream stewardship decisions. Well, the second study focused more on farmers and what they know about nutrient transport, so nitrogen and phosphorus, and what they know about how their management actions influence the, the transport of those nutrients across the landscape, the resulting impacts and whatnot. And then a little bit with that group, and we're doing more with it at this point, but what are the major influences on their land management decisions? So in study one, this was funded by the USDA through a National Integrated Water Quality, um, through the National Integrated Water Quality Program. It was a watershed scale project. And what we did is we conducted in-depth interviews with 45 Central Ohio citizens. We had a high school audience, and we also had a community audience. So we had ages ranging from 16 to 80 years old. And the interviews, again, built on an expert model, but probed knowledge about streams, watersheds, and water quality, and also probed influences on their stream-related decisions. We're currently using these findings. Um, we've already designed a kind of new high school science curriculum that's being, being used in Gahanna, which is a central Ohio Columbus area school. And we're starting to try to disseminate that and spread those results, and I'll give you information about that later. And then we're also using these findings to um, inform some community-based education and outreach programs, and those things are currently in development. So I want to give you a brief overview of the expert model. so You can kind of vision where we were going, um, visualize where we were going with these interviews. And so we talked, we not only um, looked at the literature to see what was out there, but also talked to experts um, on these sorts of issues and ultimately put together this conceptual kind of diagram that was meant to explain streamside landowner and citizen decision making um, regarding stewardship of stream and the larger watershed. Um, so focusing more on the upstream component, a little less on the downstream component. And so we had a section of the model that focused on ecological knowledge, um, this idea that there's certain things that people need to know and understand about streams and what makes them healthy. Um, we had a section that focused on threats and impacts um, and the idea that if you understand what makes a stream healthier, what should be there, what shouldn't be there, um, you have a better understanding of threats and impacts to that, to that stream and to water quality more broadly. Um, the model pointed out that these sorts of things should be informing not only law and policy but also outreach programs and that those outreach programs and law and policy would then influence the quality of an, of an individual's information gathering and processing. So quality being um, degree of motivation that they have to go out and learn about this issue, to use that information very carefully in the sorts of decisions that they're making. Um, other things that came out in this expert model that might influence information gathering and processing were kind of sociocultural factors, um, so norms and tradition and culture, uh, individual differences, so um, individual attitudes, values, beliefs that people might have that could vary across a population. And in combination, the degree to which someone would seek out information and use it very carefully would then influence the degree to which they recognize the threat. So we call this citizen internalization of threat, this idea that they would think there was a problem and they would be motivated to do something about it. Um, what we also found in our conversations with experts was this concern that not only are there these pre-internalization barriers, so these things that might prevent someone from recognizing the threat, but there's also post-internalization barriers. There are things that, for those people who have recognized the threat and want to take action, there's things that are preventing them from taking action. And ultimately, what we're trying to understand and encourage, right, are these streamside landowner and citizen decisions that could promote stream health, um, that could maybe lessen the impact of human activities on water quality across the landscape. So that's just the broad kind of picture of some of the things we we're interested in. So we developed. Um, an interview protocol or a list of questions that we went out to our 45 participants and we asked them about these different areas. You know, tell us what you know about stream health. Tell us what influences whether or not you seek out information about this problem. Um, tell us what, what influences your kind of concern about this issue, your perceptions of risk. Tell us what you're willing to do, what you think you could do um, as an individual to, to, to promote stream health. So we asked people about this. And what I want to do is I just have a couple of slides that I think will summarize some of the big findings across those 45 interviews, again, to give you a little bit of a sense of the sorts of things people are thinking about, what they know and don't know, their attitudes towards these issues, and even um, to some extent the things kind of preventing them from taking action. Uh, when we looked at ecological knowledge, there were some pretty big gaps that we thought were important to address in future communication. Uh, there was a pretty low understanding of specialized functions, um, of this idea that in the watershed there are specific features that 
serve a very important purpose that, that keeps that stream healthy, that keeps that watershed healthy, which could lessen the impact of human activity downstream. Um, and people didn't have a good understanding of that. So often when people would talk about wetlands or floodplains, it was in a very negative way. Um, that wetlands are kind of swamps and, and floodplains for kind of obvious reasons, I think to a lot of people, sound like a bad place. You don't want to build a house in a floodplain, so what good is a floodplain? Um, so we're, we thought one of the gaps that needed to be addressed was this idea of kind of specific niches um, and things that serve a very important purpose, so people might be more willing to promote the protection of those um, and more willing to not alter those through land use change. Um, another thing people had a fairly low understanding of was, was how streams are formed. So we heard a lot about um, so how streams are formed is, is related to topography and the idea that your headwaters are feeding into your larger tributaries and on downstream, but people had a reverse understanding of that. So they thought that, you know, as the Ohio River flows along and it, it branches out and it creates, you know, these smaller tributaries instead of the reverse. Um, we also saw a pretty poor understanding of just the idea of a watershed or a network. People didn't really get those connections, and that's concerning. Um, one, because if you have a reverse understanding of how water flows and how streams are formed, you don't understand the upstream-downstream connections very well. And if you don't have an understanding of a watershed, then you, you fail to make those, those connections a, across the landscape. So this idea that across the landscape, humans are influencing water um, and water quality. Um, again, fairly poor understanding of what makes streams healthy. A lot of people describe healthy streams as um, streams that are very straight and the water's flowing very fast. And so this could be because this is what they see in the environment that they live in, and they assume that that's correct or that's right. Um, and so there is a, a fairly poor understanding of what really is a healthy stream. And, and that's concerning because if people don't know what's unhealthy, they can't identify a problem and, and realize that there's a need to address that issue. Um, as far as threats and impacts, people had a very um, basic understanding, you know, chemicals, pollution, things might come from the land and get into the water, but they didn't have a more in-depth understanding of that. They didn't. Um, didn't think channelization was bad, so again, similar to what I just talked about, had a, um, a failure to really to know what ecosystem services were and the fact that um, you know humans are getting benefits from healthy systems, from, from water quality. I, we had one person who even said, well, yeah, the stream is dirty, but it's not like we get our drinking water from it. Well, you do eventually. <laughs> so, so this idea that there's a disconnect there that I think people don't understand. Um, and just this, the broader impact of human influence, that people may have had a hard time really understanding that. Uh, so based on some of these ecological knowledge gaps and, and kind of limits in that we think people's understanding of threats and impacts, some suggestions that we have at this point is to communicate change over time, um, to overcome the focus on the present state. So people see what's there now, and they don't understand that that's different from the past, that it could be different in the future. They don't have that kind of temporal perspective to really know when things are changing, when they're becoming better, when they're becoming worse. So if we can do a better job of, of visualizing that for people, that could be helpful. Um, we need to communicate how healthy streams operate, so structurally and functionally. What does a healthy stream look like? How does it operate? How does it function? Um, people don't have a good understanding of that. We need to communicate better the threats. People get the impacts, so to some degree they get kind of what results, but they don't know what causes the issue or what the source of the issue is. So we need to better communicate that and then make this link that if you do X, Y happens. People aren't always making those connections. Um, and again, we need to better communicate, I think, the influence of human activity um, across the landscape, a variety of activities, upstream, downstream, um, and the importance of some of these specialized functions, so these things that serve a very important purpose uh, in the watershed in terms of protecting water quality. When we look at some of the influences on decision making, um, the things that were driving people's um, information seeking or their likelihood to go out and find information and use it more carefully uh, were largely an environmental ethic and changing recreational opportunities. So a lot of people said, well, the reason I'm interest interested is because I care about the environment and it's the selfish people that aren't interested. So a lot of people were drawing this distinction around kind of environmental values or environmental attitudes being a big motivator. Um, and also recreational opportunities. A lot of people, the benefit that they see most directly from healthy streams, from healthy lakes, kind of across the board were these recreational opportunities, whether they be fishing, boating, swimming, more active, whether they be, um, you know, strolling along a river and enjoying the aesthetics. And so that was something we think we can capitalize on in terms of, of promoting um, 
the fact that those are benefits that could be at risk if we don't if we don't change our actions. Um, what people said was driving their internalization or their kind of recognition of the threat was just general awareness of the problem. Um, and they thought that the more available the information and the higher their personal interest, the more likely they were to be aware of the problem. And the more likely they were to be aware, the more likely they were to think about the risks and benefits, so the risks of negative action or the benefits of positive action, um, the risks of just degraded streams and the benefits of healthy streams. And then also adaptive capacity, so their, their ability to do something about it, to feel like they can make a change. And so some of our recommendations related to this was that through our future communication efforts, we need to ease the path to information, um, make it more accessible to people. There was some concern that they weren't sure who to go to or where to find information about these issues. Uh, that we need to frame the risk in light of personal interests, so health, property, things that people reported that they said they cared about. Um, including tips for recognizing problems. So this relates to the ecological knowledge piece, but a lot of people just didn't even know how they would recognize there was an issue. So tips for knowing when a stream is, is um, structurally um, incorrect or not, functionally, or not um, functioning properly, because people can't recognize that. They don't know um, what should be in the stream, what it should look like. Uh, we need to also, because this, um, this ethic, this kind of environmental ethic or value base was very important, um, you know, building this ethic or value base around environmental stewardship. If this is one of the main motivators, um, how can we kind of build that and make people more aware of that? And then finally, since recreation came out as pretty important, use recreation to educate and communicate, promote it as a benefit of healthy streams. Um, this is something that people care about and something that might have a bigger influence on not only voting behavior at kind of, you know, a top-down regulatory level, but also the bottom-up sorts of things that they could do to promote water quality. And then finally, the big barriers to action that our, that our target audience highlighted, um, the things that they thought prevented them or prevented people in general from recognizing the problem was what we were calling benign neglect. So this idea that people aren't concerned, but it's not because they don't care, it's because they don't know. They're just unaware. They don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's healthy, what's not. And so they're not concerned because they can't recognize the problem. So this points to kind of a failure, I would say, in, in communication and outreach to really reach people and make that known. <clears throat> and then the biggest post-internalization barrier, so the thing that would prevent people from taking action even though they might want to, w were economic sorts of drivers. Um, um, at a personal level, the this, this sense that if I try to do something different on the property that I own, it'll come at very high personal cost. There's not incentives to do that. And then also this, this belief that what was going on around them, so bigger land use decisions in their area were very motivated by kind of greed and business interests and things like that. Um, so these were the things that they talked about. Um, and as far as action, things they wanted to do, they thought they could and were very interested in being involved in monitoring, kind of preventive sorts of things, letting people know if there was a problem or doing things to kind of monitor other local streams. And then also more specific management decisions. So they're willing to go out um, several, lots of people on their property or on places where they can have an impact and actually manage it differently if, if the opportunity was presented. So as far as our recommendations, we felt like there was this need to communicate about problems that currently exist, um, motivate people by focusing on those risks and benefits that were most salient to them. And the things they talked about the most were uh, water quality, access and use, so this kind of recreation idea, um, human health, and then also aesthetics, they wanted to look nice. So these are things that we could focus on in terms of increasing motivation. Now we think we need to focus on actions not limited by economics, recognize that um, that can be a barrier and we can do what we can to fix that, uh, but maybe we focus on those things that are kind of um, disconnected from that issue, things that people could do that aren't going to have this high cost or won't be as tied into that issue. And then a lot of people just said, tell me what needs to be done and how to do it. So this, this concern and interest is there, but they didn't even know what they could do or how they could could accomplish that. So if we can make some of those things more obvious, I think you would have greater support for, for taking action. From the results of these studies, we, we, from this initial study, we pulled together what we call the five essential questions, just the big questions that we think um, need to be addressed through kind of future education and outreach. And like I said, at this point, we've basically uh, developed these lesson plans that are focused on these five essential questions that are being used in high school environmental science classrooms. And you can get those at the, the website that's provided here. And anyone is welcome to use those. This website also highlights other aspects of this project and other results that we've 
that we've been um, trying to get out. So you're, you're more than welcome to go and look at that and see what's there. And then, like I said, the same sort of questions and then other sorts of things more specific to the community audience are being used to, to inform education and outreach programs that we're currently working on. So study two, and I have a little less to say about this. It's earlier on. Um, but this was focused on Ohio farmers. It's a, a project funded by the Climate Water Carbon Initiative at Ohio State. And so far, we've just interviewed about 20 farmers um, about land use and land management decisions related to um, largely nutrient management on the land management side. And on the land use side, um, more having to do with urban pressures, um, changes in land use, so changes in, in the crops that they're planting and the sorts of decisions that they're making, even selling off land because of urban pressures. And we haven't analyzed that data yet, so I don't have much to say on the land use side, but on the land management side, we've done a little bit of analysis on that data, um, specifically looking at knowledge, farmers' knowledge about the nutrient cycle, uh, impacts from nutrients that are transported across the landscape, and also mitigation actions, so things that um, farmers could be doing to kind of change that impact. And then we also probed a little bit their perceptions of risk and things that would influence their land management decisions. And so what you see here is the expert model uh, for the nutrient cycle impacts and mitigation. We did um, a corresponding sort of approach for nitrogen, but here I'm just presenting phosphorus because that's the bigger issue for freshwater and the one that we wanted to focus on a little bit more. And so this expert model um, probed information about um, the transport of phosphorus across the landscape, and erosion, runoff, and whatnot, uh, the impacts of that transport, um, impacts to water quality, fresh water in particular, to soil quality, to yields and profit loss. Um, mitigation, so the sorts of things that farmers can do um, to actually prevent phosphorus loss. So what are the sorts of practices available to them and how could they change their, their management practices? Then also what's their understanding of those environmental factors? So um, when we think about climate change and how rainfall could be changing in the future and how runoff could change, do they have an understanding of those environmental factors and how they might impact phosphorus loss across the landscape. And so through our interviews, I'll just highlight a few of the things here. What you see is just the frequency of response, so the proportion of, of farmers interviewed who, who talked about and kind of understood that concept is what you're seeing here. And what's kind of interesting is um, when you think about phosphorus in particular right now, for a long time the concern was um, phosphorus coming more from erosion, and so there was a big push towards um, no-till as something that farmers could do to kind of reduce phosphorus loss, reduce um, phosphorus that's coming through erosion and entering the stream and eventually in you know, sections closer to the Great Lakes that's influencing water quality there. And farmers had a really good understanding of um, erosion as a transport mechanism, um, clearly of the impacts on water quality and soil quality, even a better understanding of that than they had of kind of personal yield and profit loss. But what you see as a gap right now is the, the transport of phosphorus in, through soluble mechanisms, so through runoff, and then the impact that that specifically has on freshwater quality. So given our current issues in the Great Lakes and the current issues we even have upstream, um, and we've had a couple big incidents here recently in Ohio, these are two pretty big gaps in knowledge and farmer knowledge um, about transport and impacts and something we might need to address to improve decision making in this area. Uh, when you look at mitigation, again, pretty good understanding across the board. Soil testing is something a lot of farmers are doing to inform their nutrient management decisions. Uh, pretty good understanding of application timing, amount, and method. Um, even here when we talk about climate change and changes in rainfall, a pretty good understanding of how that could, could impact phosphorus loss. So we think the opportunity that we have here is that we can actually um, highlight the, the current issues of soluble pea runoff and the impacts on freshwater quality in light of the things that farmers already know a lot about, application as a mitigation strategy and these environmental factors and, and perhaps enhance understanding and kind of enhance uh, land management decisions targeted towards the current problem. Um, the challenge is we don't want to um, create this reverse effect where suddenly tillage seems like a, or no-till seems like a bad idea because that's been successful, um, but we have a kind of emerging new issue when it comes to phosphorus that we need to better address on the agricultural land management side. Um, in terms of the influences on farmer decision making, we just again asked the questions and started to kind of probe some things here. Um, the younger, more environmentally concerned farmers demonstrated higher knowledge scores. What we want to look at in the future um, are, are these kind of causal relationships. So 
Are younger farmers the, are just are they more concerned? Is that perhaps due to um, changes in, in, at the um, K through 12 and even college level in terms of education of the sorts of things that are being taught, things people are thinking about? Um, is greater concern leading to greater knowledge, or is greater knowledge leading to greater concern? A lot of theory would say that um, the higher your perception of risk, the greater your concern, the more you would seek out information and the more knowledge knowledgeable you would become. Um, we can't causally say that right now, but we want to look at that a little more in the future. And what we thought was interesting, and, and I think this ties into what um, Anthony was talking about before as well, a lot of our understanding of, of and land use models and specifically the agricultural piece of that is based on economic models that assume farmers are profit maximizers and that they're going to be making land use and land management decisions in light of these big um, economic drivers, which certainly is a piece of the puzzle, but we often leave out other behavioral aspects of that decision-making process. And what we saw among this kind of smaller group of farmers so far is that their financial and environmental perceptions of risk related to nutrient loss were equal. They rated them almost exactly the, the same on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, and so what's interesting about that when you look at this other finding, which was that 83% of farmers responded that something other than profit was their primary farming goal. Things like environmental stewardship, things like lifestyle, um, promoting um, the lifestyle for future generations, those sorts of things. We could key into that a lot more, and I think we can better understand farmer decisions, land use, and land management decisions um, if we kind of broaden this, this um, assumption that profit maximization is what's driving everything that's going on there, and we can look at the sorts of trade-offs farmers are willing to make. So in summary, uh, citizen knowledge about what makes a healthy stream and human impacts on the stream is fairly low. Uh, there is a desire to take action to protect water quality, and it seems to depend a lot on awareness of the problem, perception of risk, kind of concern and impacts that people are aware of, and the perceived ability to take action. Farmer knowledge about the nutrient cycle and the things that are relevant to their decisions is fairly high, um, but it may reflect some gaps as far as the current issues that we're dealing with, as far as water quality, specifically phosphorus, and how it's transported um, most readily from agricultural systems. And there is a desire to take action to protect soil and water quality, and it does seem to depend on both financial and environmental perceptions of risk. So again, this need to kind of broaden our approach, I think, to, to understanding and predicting land use and land management change. So enhancing knowledge is important. Just to, to hit on that again, I don't want to disregard that. But communication must also address these individual differences, so differences in, in the ways that people are motivated, differences in their individual values and attitudes, differences in their perceptions of risk. We need to account for this, and we need to incorporate this, not only into our understanding of decision making, but into our models that might predict um, changes in land use and land management over time, right? Because we can address this from the behavioral level as well. Um, improving water quality then requires addressing decision making from the top down and bottom up. So it requires you know, regulatory change, it requires support for those changes, but it also requires voluntary action on the part of the broader citizenship. And climate change, when I think about these things, and it goes back to what Anthony said about climate and land use, that these are you know, two of the big factors when we think about water quality and water resources, climate change is this emerging challenge, but it's just another challenge for water quality. We've, we've had challenges along the way, um, and I think that we can, we can think more carefully about the human challenge to water quality and how we could change that maybe to mitigate some of those impacts from climate change. So the, the projects that we're starting to work on now is to, to ask this question, is there, is there potential for behavioral change to counteract any of the predicted negative impacts on water quality that could result from climate change? So if we can't stop the climate from changing, we can't stop these impacts on water quality, what can we do from the human and especially the behavioral level on the human side to counteract these changes and to maybe lessen some of these impacts that we might see in the future? So that's it. Anyone's welcome to um, email me with questions. The website's again at the bottom. The top one is our kind of personal website for the first project I talked about. The bottom is the regional reporting website um, for that project, which has more specific information. Um, you're welcome to go there to get more information about that project. If you have other questions about the farmer aspect, nothing's really available right now, but that's something that I can um, fill you in on. And we also do, for the citizen focused project, we do have an uh, expert model paper that I could share with people that kind of explains the expert model and starts to go into that detail a little bit more. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wilson. 
We have gotten some great questions through our chat feature during the presentation. So at this time, I'd like to hand the Q&A session over to Melinda Huntley. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to start off uh, with a question for Dr. Wilson. Um, also, I want to let you know we have an abundance of questions. What we are going to do is send the questions out to our speakers. They will respond and we will post their answers on changingclimate.osu.edu within two weeks. And we will be distributing that website information in a few seconds. Um, the first question we have for Dr. Wilson is, are there any significant differences in the knowledge or the attitudes of rural citizens versus urban ones? And another question came in regarding young versus old. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll do my best to answer that off the top of my head, and that might be something that I'll have to um, post a better response to later. I can look back at the data. Um, with the interviews, we're not super comfortable talking about significant differences between groups. We, we use the interviews to initially kind of probe these ideas and find out what seemed important, and then we're designing a survey right now that will go out in the spring um, to a representative sample of people living in the two watersheds that we were focusing on. Uh, to really probe these things further, and then we'll, then we'll be a lot more comfortable talking about those differences across age and across location. Um, my, my first response to that on, on the rural to urban sort of divide is certainly there are differences in awareness, um, differences in perceptions of risk, so things that people are focusing on and concerned about. Um, so there are a few differences like that. I wouldn't say that there are big um, other big individual differences, like rural people are more environmentally concerned or urban people are more environmentally concerned, I don't think that that's the case. I think the sorts of things that they're aware of and the things they focus on are different and have obvious reasons. Um, so we see a little bit of difference there, but I don't want to comment again too much on that at this point. In um, age, I'm just an over, given the 80-year-old sample, uh, we saw a lot of malaria for African students were telling us and then that their parents were telling us and that other community members were. Um, so there doesn't seem to be this kind of influence of age. Some of the older um, landowners, so people who especially owned land on a stream or owned a larger um, property in kind of suburban to rural environments, um, had higher knowledge, I would say, and I think it's because it's a more salient issue for them, and a lot of them are dealing with it directly, um, being landowners on streamside landowners. So you definitely saw a higher knowledge there, and they happened to be kind of an older group, but I don't think it was an age thing. I think it had more to do with um, the type of ownership that they were involved in. Um, so on age, yeah, I would say that that didn't have as big of a difference as you might think it would have. And so what we're trying to do is kind of um, target these gaps in knowledge kind of early on so you can catch these student populations earlier on and get them thinking about these issues because I think what's happening is as they leave the formal education system, um, unless they have a reason to be concerned, they're not thinking about these issues very actively. Great. Thank you very much. Another question for Dr. Wilson is what tools would you suggest that would give us the most bang for the buck in educating and informing citizens. Okay. Um, we did have some questions, and I didn't go over these, but some questions in the interviews about how they prefer to receive information and who they trust and, and what sorts of um, channels, I guess, they're using to get access to information. Uh, we saw some minor differences on age for that one, and so we saw um, somewhat younger audiences being more willing to access websites, being more willing to um, use these kind of new forms of media, I guess you might refer to it that way, whereas older audiences are much more likely to, to be interested in a newsletter, something that you can clearly, in terms of big bang for the buck, reach a, reach a broad audience. Um, but what we saw across the board is people really want the one-on-one -on -one interaction, which is not big bang for your buck, perhaps, but perhaps the most effective way. And so one thing that we kind of thought about for our project um, is certainly using kind of web-based tools and interactive things that we could guide people to that would give them more kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback. Um, but I think what we thought is in terms of bang for the buck is if one-on-one -on -one is most productive and it's something people kind of desire and it can be tailored to kind of specific audiences, then perhaps you focus on those audiences that are living um, in the most impaired areas. So within the two watersheds that we focused on for that study, we're able to identify kind of segments um, reaches of the streams that were particularly impaired, and if they were particularly impaired, perhaps due to kind of individual homeowner and landowner decisions and actions, so 
um, it could be related to septic systems, it could be related to kind of streamside management, um, that we would target those groups. And so maybe you put your one-on-one -on -one more intense education outreach into those critical kind of populations. And then for the broader population that maybe have less of a direct effect on water quality, um, but also could be reached in more kind of big bang for your buck ways. So um, through kind of letters, through um, sources and channels that they might already be using. So people talked about community newspapers that they like to read, using those as a way to kind of reach those groups. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for Dr. Kendall, and the question is, what are your recommendations on how best to use the information um, that you provided, particularly the information on precipitation? For example, what types of decisions can it inform, and who might be the decision makers that um, might be most uh, applicable for that information? Sure. <coughs> well. One of the first things I would say is that there is increasingly strong evidence that we're seeing more extreme precipitation events. And that, so w what we really mean by that is that, that large events over a short duration um, are occurring more frequently and that we know the impacts that that has on our stream water quality because in large part of our aging infrastructure um, can be really significant. So I think that the, from, from the evidence, both changes we've observed historically as well as forecasts, we could say with fair confidence that we're, we're likely to see more and larger events and thus um, people deciding whether to invest in, say, a storm, a storm sewer, sanitary sewer separation project could perhaps look at an accelerated deadline for that, for that project or, or look at investing one in the first place. So, I mean, that's a big decision that we'll have, and it's obviously expensive, but it has, it has big positive impacts right away. Um, in terms of other types of things that precipitation can affect um, directly, there, there aren't as many that aren't related to stormwater management. Um, they're in the stormwater management field, precip obviously is very important in terms of sizing capacities for, for runoff retention and so forth. But in terms of looking at water quality um, through more diffuse impacts like uh, agricultural uses and, and urban, uh, urban water use and so forth, um, probably a better approach is to, is instead of looking at it as, as a type of management decision, look at it as an education, from an education standpoint of trying to better understand when do you apply fertilizers, what time of year is, is best, when are you least likely to see extreme pre precip type things, um, and then to, to approach that from an education standpoint less than maybe a management one in, in, from, in terms of an active management one. Great, thank you. And um, another question we have, actually it's kind of a two-part question, and it refers to uh, the chart that we're trying to, to pull up right now. We hope this is the right one. Um, what factors were taken into account in the temperature change graph? And a second part of that question is, were there any tipping points taken into account, such as the rise to certain oceanic temperatures that would create a runaway release of frozen methane from the ocean floor? Right. Well, th th that's a great question. So um, just a general background on the types of models that were brought into this multi-model ensemble. Um, what they are is, is, is they're, they're what are known as general circulation models, or GCMs, and they attempt to describe the, mo the movement of, wa of water, energy, and momentum, so the movement of air mass through the atmosphere and then through its interaction with both the land surface and within the ocean. So these are our, our big complicated models that run on large computing clusters um, at national labs and universities. And there's a, a variety of models that were brought together from some of the older generation models being run overseas to some of the latest generation models being run here in the U.S. and, and other uh, in international uh, places like Japan and Germany and U.K. and Australia that have the latest cutting edge um, uh, GCM technologies. So they're really very complicated models that describe the physical processes of the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land surface. And so in terms of including tipping points, tipping points are included in as much as they're predicted by the models. So things like ice sheet dynamics are predicted by the models. And if tipping points are observed in those models, that's one of the ways we learn about them. Um, and when we learn about sensitivities, for instance, you might have heard that two degrees C 
is the temperature that increase that we want to avoid because we think there are numerous tipping points around there. Tipping points involving things like like seabed methane are are not incorporated because they're really not widely understood about either the extent of seabed methane or how that methane is going to respond to warming ocean temperatures. So that's more of an area of active research and uh, rather than um, what's represented here could sort of be viewed as mainstream climate model predictions. And these are these climate model predictions, by the way, were created, um, I think they were created in the 2004 to 2005 timeframe. So they're now approaching six years old. And within the next couple of years, we're going to see the results coming from the latest generation of models that try and get at more of the, the types of, of tipping point mechanisms like the questioner asked about. OK, thank you. Uh, we're actually out of time for any more questions. But we do have quite a few really great questions. And so we're planning on having those posted um, after uh, Dr. Kendall and Wilson answer those within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I wanted to, just to wrap up, I wanted to, again, thank Dr. Kendall and Dr. Wilson for their willingness to talk to us today about water quality issues as they relate to a changing climate. Also, a thank you to the Great Lakes Water Resources Program for helping to sponsor this webinar with the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team. I did want to mention that resources on many of the subjects we've addressed on climate change are located on our changingclimate.osu edu website, including the archive of these webinar presentations. This webinar series will continue next month with a presentation by OSU's Peter Curtis on January 11th, with the series continuing monthly through June. Thank you again to the speakers and all the participants on the webinar. Please go to the uh, URL for the survey, please fill that out if you could. It's on in the chat. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you will join us again in the upcoming webinar. Thank you and happy holidays. <laughs>